to Cloud and Queer, the podcast by SADA for innovative business leaders and technology enthusiasts, where we explore how Google Cloud is transforming the industry and what that means to you. Now, here's your host, Tony Safoyan. All right, let's welcome our very special guests uh, this morning. My very good friend, we've known each other for a decade plus, uh, Nathan Rader. Welcome to Cloud and Clear. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. It's great to be reconnected after all that time we spent together on the ground, you know, selling together, doing work together with Google Cloud and now in your new role. Do um, you want to tell us about what you're doing now at uh, Parsable? Thank you. Yeah, it'd be great, Tony. And I'll I'll try to keep all of our uh, personal stories to a limited, but I've, I do have some stories that we've got to share with the group for sure. But I um, just joined Parsable about nine months ago as their chief revenue officer. Spent 11 years at Google Cloud and prior to that with Oracle and IBM before that. But I just joined Parsable as a CRO, working on um, all of our expansion opportunities and growing our sales teams globally. Parsable, at a very high level, we exist to solve some problems that industrial companies have. And those problems are really around speed and how their processes adjust and how their workforce adjusts to changes. And as we know, and you know very well, a lot of these companies are dealing with an aging workforce, a lot of tribal knowledge, and a lot of this data is captured in static processes. So our, our mantra is we exist to empower these industrial workers with modern digital tools to improve productivity, safety, and quality of the products. And so that's uh, joined nine months ago. It's been a great experience, fast growth company out of Silicon Valley. It's been a great. It's been a great run. That's that's exciting. How, how do you think? Because um, you were there for a very long time with Google Cloud, like we were uh, in the same period, kind of starting in the same period, and you know we saw tons of changes, tons of transformation in the market, but also cloud as a as a concept, uh, cloud economics, consu- consumption economics, sort of infinite scale you know, selling to customers, delivering solutions to customers. How do you think that laid maybe the foundation for uh, for your current role today? Like, how did that influence ultimately uh, your decision to want to go and uh, do, do this at Parsable? It's a good question. I, I absolutely love SaaS companies because you, at SaaS companies, you have to earn the company's business and your client's business every single day. And you think about what Google did so well is they built a brand around earning the trust and the loyalty of consumers every day with, with an amazing search engine. And they took that and, and modified it to the enterprise and with cloud and what we used to be called Google Enterprise. And they really had to earn the loyalty and trust of these companies every day. And that, that was for me what really drew me to Parsable was the fact that Industrial companies have needs and, and these same digital needs. And traditional software companies, you think about ERP systems, they can oftentimes be very inflexible. And you might deploy an ERP system, but the business changes. And they don't have time to go wait six months, 12 months, 18 months to change something. So they need a, a flexible tool that can adjust to their, their needs quickly. And so I love SaaS because we're constantly being challenged by our clients to earn their business every day. If, if they don't like what we provide, they just simply don't renew. Metrics that drive me are not about just a maintenance subscription. It's about what are my usage? Are my people really using the product the way I intend it to be? So it's really been a great, great, great move. And I've, I've really, the, the Google experience has really helped me with this move a ton. I can't tell you how much of our culture and our values and our strategy was shaped by a very, very different um, enterprise software model than the traditional on-premise models that existed in years past. Everything like our obsession around um, uh, customer satisfaction, uh, usage and consumption, earning the customer's business every month if, if, if not every year, like I think so much of that is, first of all, it's great for customers because at the end of the day, I think they win by the urgency that's created, not only in the, how the product develops and evolves, like the roadmap has to be very, very enticing, but 
in how we support, service, deliver, deploy customers, not only in the, the first project, but forever. Like, and, and I think it drives all the right behavior and aligns incentives in the best possible way. And I look back, it's been ingrained in us by deploying, you know, first cloud search um, on premise back in the days with the GSA. But, but G Suite was absolutely the thing that customers could switch off of any time. And by the way, when you were delivering it, you were about to change the user experience for 100% of the employees for the number one used application every day. It was all about adoption, all about CSAT. It was very, very different than software in the past. That's exactly right. And, and, and those companies that obsess over their clients and the way that their clients use the products are the ones that will grow. And, and that's what, you know, I look at Google and I look at Parsable and I, I attest a lot of our growth. Yes, we have great products. Yes, we have uh, really good features, but we listen to our clients. And when they tell us they need this, we have to, we have to move quickly to go adopt it. And so that's why we continue to grow at the pace that we do. And that's why I believe, you know, your business and, and, and Google will continue to grow at the pace that, that it grows because they do listen and they're, they're structured their organizations around listening. The other big shift that I think Google uh, has realized over the last decade plus, and we realized with Google is the enterprise space, the way it's different from the consumer space is that in our world in enterprise software, having the best product is not enough. You can't just say, well, I have the best product. Enterprises will just buy it and adopt it. There's a whole set of other things that you have to execute really, really well to not only gain market share, but also to renew and, and, and keep customers sort of at a, at a clip that any subscription based business model needs. So what are the what are those things that you think you learned at Google that you're now kind of as a chief revenue officer at Parsable? like well aware that needs to needs to be done well inside your organization? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, one of the things that I, I go back to some of the, the early days of Google and one of the things that I really love that one of the godfathers of Google back in the past, a gentleman named Bill Hippenmeyer, you probably remember mm-hmm. Bill really well, now yeah. CEO over at Glue. You know, Bill really nailed this after about a year or two of fumbling around early when he, he really determined that clients early in the process on the journey of adopting a technology, they need to be shown the whole roadmap, right? They, they need to be told and they want to be told how this evaluation is going to work, how the deployment is going to work, and they want the whole picture early. And I kind of use this example, you know, I, I, I was thinking of back to the first time I went in to buy my wife's wedding ring. I knew nothing about diamonds, right? Can you imagine the very first time I walked into a store, if someone didn't tell me about the four C's or someone didn't tell me about cut and clarity and they start going through all of this and then expect me to go spend 20, 30, $50,000, right? There's no way I'd do it. Right. So consequently, why would we expect our clients to go invest hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, if we don't explain to them the full roadmap. And I really learned at Google and Saad has been a really big, you know, this is what you've built your business around, right? Is, is helping along the journey, not just in the evaluation phase, but the deployment and then ultimately the post-deployment. And that for me has been extremely valuable at Parsable. When I first came on, we had a approach that I would say it was, you know, it was it was definitely mature, but we needed to take it to the next level of how we got our clients to deploy. I felt like we had a really good approach to an evaluation, but our deployment methodologies really didn't have a lot of training them to go deploy. And and that's one thing I learned, you've got to build a governance structure and a train the trainer model that if you do that well early, clients will adopt it without you. You know, they don't want a consultant to hang around and be on staff, right? They want to learn how to do it themselves. And so early on, you know, SADA, Google, and Parsable is doing this now today. When we engage with a client, we don't just tell them how to buy the product. We tell them how they're going to learn to train themselves to use it and ultimately run it. 
And, and that's when one of the biggest lessons that I've seen transferable that um, when clients are told that they want to do more with you, you really truly become a partner and not just uh, not just a vendor. Yeah, I think in SaaS or anything transformational, and we, we had to, and I think by virtue of being smaller, like we didn't really have a choice to have this approach, but it's really served us well. And I think it's actually starting to resonate even the, if to, to the largest enterprise buyers of, 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 of G Suite, GCP, et cetera, is our approach around like sending, you know, the SWAT team to do implementations. It's actually much more oriented on, yes, ensuring implementation success, ensuring adoption, removing risk, being like that ultimate guide um, and, and using all of our you know, prescribed, uh, prescribed methodology, past performance experience to ensure success. But at the same time, what we're actually doing is enabling the customer to be very, very self-sufficient by the time that we're done. And that's different than, again, traditional enterprise software develop, uh, developed uh, for and delivered like in the uh, enterprise by GSIs who their whole model is around how many bodies can we throw at a problem at what utilization rate for how many years. <laughs> right. And it's sort of, that doesn't create a lot of, um, you know, nod, knowledge capital within the customers per se. And actually all that stuff gets outsourced. And I think the customers are not better off for it in the long term, whether they're deploying Google cloud or parsable or anything else. And, um, I think just by, by virtue of being smaller and not having 50 people to put on projects, we were forced to create a very different implementation approach that was as, um, as efficient as possible, which required us to enable customers to be pretty self-sufficient when they're done. Of course, you and I will send people back to do other work that's more complicated, but that's only when uh, they really need it, not like we're just sticking around to maximize our professional services revenue dollars. You know, this this couldn't be more uh, relevant to a story that I just had with one of our clients. We we do a lot of work with Shell out of Houston, and they've deployed the Parsifal platform to multiple different well sites. And one of my shining moments was when they called us because they wanted to share an internal video that they created that they're circulating within the company about how the Parsifal platform is helping them gain insights into their operational efficiencies on their, you know, across all of their wells. And they created this wonderful, beautiful video that is circulated around Shell to train others how to use the Parsifal platform. And they didn't even tell us they were doing it. They said, hey, we've got this. And, and naturally, the first thing we want to do is, oh, can we share it to the world? They said, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. We need yeah. to get this thing professionally done. But that's for me, when I look at when, we, when we've done our job well as a SaaS company is when we have those stories of companies that build their own testimonials because we train them well, right? Nothing makes me happier when you see a customer take something like that and run with it. Um, when customers are doing like their global, you know, go live videos and all the sort of change management adoption things and programs and little parties and events they're throwing when they're going live on G Suite or they create their own sort of uh, uh, videos or documents around like, you know, this is our new like dev culture and here's how we're thinking about DevOps, like, uh, which is harder to get engineers to get excited about stuff like that. But generally speaking, Absolutely. Like we, we help set the foundation. We help remove the risk of doing something that they've never done before. And we've done thousands of times. And then beyond that, I think our success is measured by literally how uh, self-sufficient a customer co becomes after. And, and here's the other beautiful thing about consumption economics and subscription economics is that if you can enable your customer to increase usage on their own over time, you're benefiting from that, right? Like if you don't have to deploy additional professional services for them to adopt more of the platform and you're participating, you know, like us, we, we resell quite a bit, especially in corp and, and, and enterprise for G Suite, et cetera. But if that usage goes up and they're doing it on their own, that is a huge benefit to, to SADA. So like all the, all the incentives and to, and to Google and to Parsable, incentives again in this model are beautifully aligned to promote and motivate our ability to enable customers, not like hoard knowledge 
and force him to outsource things to us just to be successful on these platforms. You couldn't have said it better. I, I don't, I can't remember a time I've been in, in technology for 20 years. I can't remember a time when the goals of the software vendor and the goals of the clients were more aligned. If they don't use the SaaS, everybody in the ecosystem loses. And it's yep. just, that was not the case. You know, a lot of people, if you, if you remember back in the, 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, the, the, the goals of the vendor were not aligned with the client's goals. They were just focused on landing the software and then exiting, right? Yep. It's a great time to be a buyer. It really is a great time to be a buyer. And it's a, it's a great time to be in the ecosystem. Yeah, and it creates the right kind of competitive pressure for everyone to get better as well. We all have to earn our keep month over month, year over year. Um, but then when it works, it's a beautiful economic model, right? Like the growth that you're, you're experiencing would be impossible without uh, a very high renewal rate, expansion of the, you know, the install base, of course, adding a lot of net new. And the way that compounds over time is like the economics behind it are amazingly predictable, which gives us a lot of uh, line of sight in terms of our investment, re uh, investment uh, capacity, reinvestment capacity. And uh, that allows us, again, to build the infrastructure to support our customers even better over time and to meet the demands of the market. It's not like you sold a bunch of stuff, you got a big check. Uh, who cares how successful it is that the customer ever deploys the stuff you just sold them? But three years from now, you're going to call them again to ask for a renewal. <laughs> it's very, very different. It's very different. So I know that Parsable is a, a G Suite shop. I think you know, pretty common sort of in the, the digital native sort of uh, software vendor space. Uh, I don't know what market share G Suite has in that, but it's significant. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that was natural for you. Like you've been on the platform for a decade plus when you joined Parsables are like, great. Um, uh, well, how, what do you think it means for an organization like Parsable to be on G Suite uh, as a platform for communication, collaboration, et cetera? Um, and, and what's the culture like there as a result? Yeah, that's a great question. So Parsable is, a, is an interesting case study. We're, we're deployed in 140 different countries. So while we, uh, we, we exclusively, I say exclusive, we actually focus across really three main segments. We focus in consumer packaged goods, resources, which is um, chemical companies and, and, and oil and gas, and then we also focus on auto and aerospace. Um, so one of the things that, that we find is that all these companies are global by nature. And so we support over 13 different languages now. We're deployed in 140 countries. Our largest de deployment is over uh, 56 plants. And all these plants are spread out everywhere. So we have to support our clients globally. And without G Suite, we wouldn't be able to, to do that. I mean, we... We love the ability to collaborate on docs and teams. We, uh, we use all of the tools around our calendaring and emails. I think though, one of the things that has got me you know, most excited, and I, I think back, it's a pretty funny story, but I was, I was kind of going back to some old stories of G Suite and how it's developed. When I joined Google, I was one of the first sellers of G Suite. And I remember crowding in a, I think it was a Hyatt, um, room in the basement and there were literally probably 20 Google Cloud sellers. Michael Locke, Dave Gerard were some of the founders. Raj Sheth were, were there. Yeah. And I mean literally this hotel, Tony, it was one of the dumpiest rooms. You can't imagine a Google event at one of these hotels now. They wouldn't even <laughs> think about it, right? But this event, Michael brought up one of the um <clears throat> brought up one of the the engineers and he was an intern. And we were really excited because this intern was going to build a BlackBerry connector. And, and, and it was just like, that's what we need. We've got to have the BlackBerry connector for Gmail. These clients need it. They want it. And two months later, the intern left and went back to college. So we didn't get a BlackBerry connector that year. And it was like, that was the type of company that we were working for. And I remember how bummed all the sellers were because it's like, you know, we really can't go we can't go do this because we don't have the BlackBerry connector. And so I tell that story to fast forward and say, you know, one of the drivers that Google allows us to do is really work, work mobile. And we take it for granted now how seamless it is. 
And we have to look back at the history a little bit and say it wasn't too long ago where the ability to work on docs, to get data on mobile devices, frankly, companies like Parsable wouldn't exist. I mean, our core platform is a mobile work execution device for industrials. If it weren't for the, the titans of Google and Microsoft actually leading the charge in mobile, we wouldn't be who we are. And so, you know, coming back all full circle, um, I'm really excited about where the market's going with mobile. And G Suite has been a big, you know, push towards that. But I'm also really excited about where we're going with data. And, and that, you know, you hear this a lot of times, you know, data is the new commodity. And that can be a, you know, a, a, a catchphrase a lot. But, but what I'm seeing in the market is data is really becoming the enabler for a lot of these companies to move quicker. That's really what it's about. You know, when we look at an industrial company, and we've got quite a bit in, in the industrial space. I was just talking to one of the largest packagers based out of Atlanta. And one of the things that they asked us is they said, on, on our plant lines, we've got to be able to change a process that two or 300 people work on. We've got to change it overnight if something's broken. And you know, traditional ERP systems, traditional software just can't hit that end worker as quickly with the change that needs to be done. So we exist because the data that's being captured by these frontline workers are exposing inefficiencies in the process and they've got to make quick changes. And so I come back to you know, the Google strategy and the Microsoft strategy, the better that these cloud companies can help enable these manufacturing companies, enable us to capture data and do more with it, the better the ecosystem is going to grow. And ultimately, the better these companies that we serve are going to be able to move faster. Yeah, the amount of data being produced these days, obviously, is, is immense. And again, five, 10 years ago, the challenge was like, how do we even store this data? How do we get the data? How do we have these smart devices that can generate like the bits that tell us how these physical world things are performing, right? And I think the the data gathering and the cost of storage for data like has made that like that's not the issue anymore. But I do agree that especially when you talk about the need for traditional industrials to completely transform both culturally, strategically, uh, business process wise and so on um, is is the data is going to unlock that that opportunity, but only if they're able to uh, make sense of the data, create insights out of out of the data and create actionable um, uh, sort of t even t tactical decisions have to be made out of the data. And I think that's whoever's able to do that best as a customer is obviously going to have a huge advantage over its peers that haven't really mastered that. That's right. No, you're exactly right. And, and I, you know, what we're really bullish on and you think about the three main cloud providers, what they've done so well is they've created this um, API-based infrastructure that you could go get parts of your service really easy and you can integrate them into your core product. So you know, we've integrated some core functionality from Google into our data analytics and some of our insights. And one of the things that that's enabled us to do is launch new products faster. And so the ecosystem of the cloud providers, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they're, they're really making it easy for companies like us to take functionality that our customers are telling us they want and, and, and integrate it really, really quickly. And so that allows me when I go to my customer success team and talk to them about what our clients are asking us to do, I don't have to go hire 10, 20, 30 engineers at Parsable to go build it. I go to Google, I go to Microsoft and I say, hey, can you, can you help me with this? And next thing I know, I've got a technology or an API that I plug into my product and it, and it helps me do it. That's real value. And, I, and I'm a digital native, but the same goes for you know, whether or not you're a financial service company. You know, it doesn't make sense now to go staff up to go build these technologies when you can get it from uh, at a very, very low cost. You can get it from these providers. Yeah. Not only is it a cost thing, but to your point, it's a time to market thing. And even in, let's say you'd, you'd solve for both, you had unlimited funds and unlimited time, like it'd be very debatable if, you know, you or I or any of our largest customers can build a better 
uh, ML engine that Google can, or better, you know, vision recognition, better text to speech, better analytics. Very hard to do it better than the people that do it for a living. And I think that's the magic and the secret sauce. And what's great about this modular approach, uh, the API based approach you're defining, actually, like if your application, core application, runs on something else or on premise, doesn't mean that you can't benefit from some of those platform as a service offerings that are best in class. And you can sort of pick and choose. And I think that's really empowering for anybody that, like Parsable, uh, like your core business is your application, but also for large customers who are building you know, their own applications in-house, like the fact that they can benefit from Maps APIs for the best geolocation services, MLAI APIs, video recognition, BigQuery for like major data analytics or so on and so forth. I, I think we're, you know, it's sort of a magical time to be in the, in the business of software because then you can just really focus on the things that Google and others will never build that's core and unique to you and your vertical. And then you can still get best of breed from those uh, science fiction like <laughs> offerings and APIs they're making available to everyone. So where do you see um, Parsable going in the next you know, five years? And I think, look, um, it's an amazing time, amazing market, uh, especially for cloud and SaaS, especially for organizations that are helping traditional industrials transform and become tech companies to become smart with their data to refine and automate a bunch of processes that were manual and kludgy in the past. So I think I think it's it's a it's good times ahead. But like how do you ensure in your leadership style, in how you hire, in how you influence the executive team and the board that you retain your culture and um, to be able to continue on op- uh, executing on the opportunity ahead? Where, where Parsable is going, and I think it's very analogous to where Google G Suite's going, is that it, it, we see the challenges of a frontline worker being very similar to what Google G Suite has solved for a lot of the knowledge workers. You know, one of the biggest areas when I was at Google of growth was in you know retail, right? Retail these these workers needed to have an email address in their locations, right? We see that same you know, need within industrials where a frontline worker, they don't need to touch SAP or their IBM Maximo, but the, the value that they're driving to the process of bottling a product or you know, making a, a consumer perishable, you know, it's extremely important. And so where Parsable is going to go is we're going to continue to make that what we call that last mile of the connected worker experience as seamless as possible. Meaning I value that frontline worker. I value their safety. I value their touching of the products. You you hear so much about sustainability and quality of products. You know, you hear about some of these batch recalls and it's just, it's just devastating on a company's bottom line. So we're going to continue to build functionality to make that frontline worker front and center. We, we have this saying at Parsable that, that, that robots aren't going to uh, replace the human anytime soon. I think even Elon Musk made this comment the other day that you can't replace a human with a robot. And it's really true. And so I, I look at that kind of coming back to your second question about leadership. Um, I just finished reading a book called Essentialism by Greg McCowan. It's oh, great. it's on my list. You know, Rob Enslin uh, talked about that at the Accelerate. He had it sort of in the keynote. And um, I got it. It's on my list. I'm actually reading uh, Multipliers, which is also kind of heavy on on sort of the type of leadership that essentially multiplies the you know collective intelligence in a, in a team or in a person and, and creates outsized results. But Robinson's actually referred to in uh, Multipliers from his SAP days about his leadership style, but also the reason I bought. Uh, essentialism was because he he showed it on the on the keynote. So tell me about it's that. Great, it's a great book, and I'll tell you how it relates to our business and how my leadership style is evolving. Every time that we as leaders say yes to something, it's saying no to something else. And one of the things that I'm learning is for a leader to be really really effective, they have to be comfortable to say no and focus on what really matters to impact their business and their teams. And 
one of the things that we are doing at Parsable is because we, we can't say yes to every single feature request. We can't say yes to every single customer that wants to dabble with our product. So we are really, really focusing on our core industries where we're having success. Consumer packaged goods, um, the manufacturing space, um, resources, which includes chemicals and oil and gas. And we are going to say no to some industries because we just need to say yes to these. Now, there will be a time when we go into these other industries, but it's really hard as a young company that can get distracted. It's hard as a young leader. When you get distracted, you get pulled into a meeting here and a meeting there. And I loved what, um, in fact, I, I always remember back Sergey Brin when um, he was leading Google for a while, um, or it might have been Larry Page actually when he was leading Google, he had a mandate within the company. This was probably back in 2005. He sent an email out to the whole company that said, if you go to a meeting and there's not a decision maker in the meeting that can make a decision on the topic, you have my permission to leave the meeting. So essentialism is about doing the things that matter and saying no to certain things and really, really um, driving towards you know, what really matters. Uh, it's also about um, one of the most things, important things that matters as a leader is your health. And we don't take for we take that for granted as leaders. We think that we're invincible, and we have to focus on some things like sleep. We've got to focus on on our health because if we say yes to everything and no to our health, you're going to be in a hospital. <laughs> and so uh, that's another good example of just what I'm trying to do is just really balance my life where I'm saying no to certain things, and it's not easy, Tony. It's not easy. Nathan, I think that. Uh, you're probably aware, but the halo effect of how you show up and uh, how you demonstrate what's important to you as a leader of the company, how it really impacts the teams, you know, in all sides. And um, I'm a big believer in like the way, you know, what you think and what you say and what you do should be in harmony. And I think that's the definition of happiness frankly. And, um, and I think, you know, you demonstrate essentialism or self-care or um, being really careful with what you say yes to, right? In, in a sort of in your daily life. And I think that's the only way that it works. Because if you say this, but do that, I think it just creates all sorts of confusion. But you hit on two or three things which are super... Uh, you know, intimately important to me, which we also have to say no a lot. And um, for us right now, the question is, well, we said no to like, we had a little Facebook thing. We tried, we shut that down. We had to pick, you know, Google or Microsoft. We pick one, a very hard decision. I had to see like 82 of our people, many of them have been with us for a decade plus, who were like family kind of, you know, become part of another great company, but no longer part of part of ours. And um, so those are tough decisions, but ultimately the best decision. So even things we'd said yes to in the past, we had to like then change our, you know, make, you know, have this existential flexibility around moving in a different direction because we were sure that was the right direction. But even today, as you point out, we get asked all the time, when are you going global? Oh, you need a London office. Like the leaders, you know, within EMEA and Europe are like, oh, we could really use you here. We could... And, I'll, and I have to be so like as sort of uh, fulfilling it would be from an ego standpoint to say, I have a London office, I have a Singapore office, I have a Mexico City office. Saying no is so the right decision because of limited energy, limited resources, etc. And so the way you focus on industry verticals is sort of the way we focused on U.S. and Canada for now. And we also you know, just as all enterprise software partners and vendors evolve to become very specific about what type of work they will do, whether it's what type of horizontal things they're going to be good at or what industries they're going to address vertically. Super important to be deliberate about that. So I applaud your discipline around that. I think that is absolutely essentially important to to long term success. And I believe in uh, uh, just sort of this infinite game mindset out of Simon Sinek's new book called The Infinite Game, which is like, we're playing a very, very long game, 
And to be able to do that, we have to be satisfied with incremental progress across key areas. But the practical aspect of that is like, we have to have the energy and the health <laughs> to run that marathon, right? Uh, it's actually, it goes forever. So um, I've, been, I've been really, and maybe it's like turning 40 or something, but the last few years have been very, very like a, 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 a rude awakening around how like, you know, uh, fallible we can be like physically. We're not um, uh, invincible. And I see it like f- every few months, like another, like a 42 year old friend of mine just had a heart attack. And our, our good friend, Adam Massey, you know, 38 years old, had a heart attack. And he now talks about it in this podcast and stuff like that. So, man, the self-care thing. But look, if you, if you get it right, which I'm sure you have, and I feel like I'm getting there. It's almost like a superpower, though. It is. And, you know, I was, I was recalling back before we, we got on. You know, I don't know if you recall, but the first time we met was at a coffee shop in Kansas City. Yeah. And we were probably, we're about the same age. So we were probably late 20s. Yeah. And I think Sada had about 10 employees at the time. Sounds right. <laughs> And uh, we were talking about how we were going to go tackle H&R Block. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we never sold anything to H&R Block. Hopefully, maybe Google has at some point now. Yeah. But um, I, I, I look back to that and I thought, you know, one of the things that we wanted to conquer the world, right? Yeah. We, and we thought we could. And what I think I've, I've realized and learned, and you said it just a second ago, the people that succeed are not the ones that have great big big, huge accomplishments. I mean, that those people are usually forgotten. It's the ones that have incremental small wins and the companies that continue to grow and make incremental gains are the ones that are built to last, the ones that last forever. And that's what I think Sada has done really, really well. And I'm really excited about Parsable is that we are, we are taking incremental gains to grow. Sada took incremental gains. You didn't just expand globally day one. You, you took the right approach to grow at the right speed and you're now built to last, right? And that's the types of companies that, that we'll look back one day and we'll say, these are the type of companies that really made a difference, right? And we haven't even taken any capital, right? I think, and obviously the divestiture gives us some, you know, additional reinvestment capital should we need it, but we're even careful about that. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, it might be cool to, you know, raise 20, 30, 50 million dollars and go make acquisitions because that's what, you know, the cool kids are doing. Um, (laughs) But we're like, actually, we like this, uh, the culture we have. We like this uh, growing only as fast as we can afford to and so far build it before you buy it approach because I think, you know, we have some unique approaches on how we do that. And of course, in a product company, you generally have to raise so we're blessed to be in services where you can take now 20 years to kind of get to where we are. But uh, but I think that discipline, saying no, I think that's exceptionally strong and good words of wisdom to leave our audience with because all the things that we do can seem like uh, they, were, they were accomplished overnight and we totally like sacrifice everything to get there, including our health and all these things. But actually... What's most surprising is what can be achieved over a decade if you're just consistent about self-care and how you execute. So um, any last sort of words of wisdom for our listeners? If I could just put one word, I would say the mantra of patience is, is so important. And you've got this. Um, I see some of your sellers. I think of people like Edmund, uh, who I've worked with before in the past, who's just got great amount of patience. Yeah, I get this question all the time. I, I, I probably do a hundred interviews a month and I get this question all the time. What are your best performing sellers? What do they have? And I answer this the same way every time. They have this perfect balance of urgency with patience. And that's what I think good leaders and good companies for that matter should do. They're, they're urgently driving towards a goal, but they balance it with patience knowing that they can't achieve it just one event that they have to do one event at a time, one daily win. We just finished our fiscal year and had amazing growth. And I kept telling my sellers the last week said, don't worry about tomorrow, just win today. 
like just win today. And I, I, our clients, the same thing. Don't, you know, you have to worry about tomorrow, but win today. And that's what I think I would just, you know, just give the listeners some advice is have the perfect balance of urgency with patience. And if you do that, I really do believe that you will find happiness. You will find that harmony, that, 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 that levelness, and you'll also be successful in your career. That's right. No, I think I equate that to uh, there being a difference between stre- uh, stress and pressure. Pressure is good. That's how diamonds are made for your, you know, for, for your engagement ring. <laughs> stress is bad. Stress lowers IQ, right? And, um, and I think uh, being tough on issues and challenges, but being easy on people is the right, you know, as the book, you know, from the multipliers would say, like, that is, that is, those are elements of a good leader. And I think those things are infectious. If you lead that way, other people tend to gravitate towards that and, and change their own styles, I think, uh, uh, to be aligned. And I think uh, as, as leaders, we have a responsibility to influence kind of even beyond the groups that we directly manage. So I applaud you for that level of uh, self-reflection and awareness. And uh, I love how in these uh, cloud and clears, we, we end up not talking about technology at all. And I think um, this, is, this is really, really awesome for, for our listeners. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. I can't wait to see what the next 5, 10, 20 years look like. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.